This is Alex, and welcome to Barely Braided, where we're taking a deep, deep dive into foster care, adoption, and all things parenting, even the sticky stuff. episode 19 and the timing of this episode is actually really ironic because today I get to talk to somebody who has very useful information but information that I was specifically seeking out literally the day before we started talking on Instagram. So for those of you who have been following our story, I currently have the most beautiful and adorable little eight-month-old African-American foster daughter. Her name is Ari, and I had absolutely no experience in how to take care of her hair properly. And of course, I tried to do a ton of research, but I quickly realized that it was difficult to find the answers to the specific questions that I had, especially because she's so young, she's just a baby. And so when I would ask in groups or forums, everybody told me something different. I was always getting different answers. So luckily for me, Kanisha with a company called Tutus and Tennis Shoes reached out and told me her story at exactly the right time. It was just what I needed. So today I feel so very fortunate to have her with us because my questions for her actually began before we were even able to digitally meet. Um, When I visited her website, I was blown away. It was so cute. I felt like it was made it just for me. It was calling my name. Tutus and Tennis Shoes is an online resource providing hair care, education, and even their own product line to people like me who need a ton of help in this area. So big welcome to Kanisha. Hi, how are you? I'm well. Thank you for that awesome introduction. I feel real special right now. <laughs> I hope I did okay. Um, I just, I thought your website was so cute and I loved your story so much. So the intro was definitely well deserved. Yes. Um, thank you very much. You did a great job. I think you hit the nail right on the head. Awesome. Cool. Well, if you don't mind, we'll jump right in. Tell us a little bit about your background in cosmetology. All right. Um, so I went to cosmetology school about 12 and a half years ago. I can, <laughs> I keep track of how long it's been because of my son's age. So I was actually pregnant with my son and I was like, sheesh, I have got to figure out a different career path because I can't, I was a light and sound tech before I became a cosmetologist. And you oh, can't cool. climb ladders and hang lights as easily when you got a kid in your stomach. So uh, you, that would make sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't work out as well. So um, I decided to follow in my grandmother's footsteps actually and um, go to cosmetology school. I knew that I could be creative. I knew that my grandmother had raised six children, including grandchildren on mostly a cosmetology income. And that includes throughout recessions and depressions. So I was like, well, this has got to be a pretty good idea. And then when I Googled, of course, it was saying that it was one of the recession proof careers. So I jumped in whole body and uh, (laughs) whole pregnant body. Yeah. (laughs) When I was in cosmetology school, I quickly figured out that standing behind a chair doing everyday hairstyles, as I call it, was not for me. I found it a little bit unfulfilling. So I decided, well, I want to be a platform artist. I knew I wanted to teach and demonstrate. I knew I still wanted to be a part of production. And so through the course of my career, I thought over and over again, I want to be a platform artist. I want to be a platform artist. And so then I tried to research, well, how do you become a platform artist? And some of the stuff said you needed to become an educator or an instructor. So I went back to school for my instructor's license. I learned how to teach. And then I came out and I started working at cosmetology schools teaching And I was still like, uh, this isn't quite what I want to do. And so I went back into a salon and I started working solely with children, mostly by accident. (laughs) And then when I moved to Des Moines, Iowa, I did it on purpose. So now I'm like, oh no, I absolutely only want to work on children and I wanted to have a children's salon. And so I opened one. And fast forward some more, I realized that families needed education more than they needed a hairstylist. Families did enjoy coming to me and getting their biweekly styles or whatever it was, but they also needed to know from beginning to end how to take care of their child's hair at home and how to really build the self-confidence in their child and also pass those skills along 
And so I started to try to fill that need and focus on the education more than just styling or having people come to me. Okay. I love that. So I'm going to back up just a little bit, just because I'm not familiar with the term platform artist. What does that mean? Okay. So a platform artist is a cosmetologist who typically works for one brand and travels the world. A lot of times, if you're really successful, demonstrating and educating people about that particular brand's um, hair care line. So say I just throw a brand out there that I used to like when I was in school, Redken. Say I've, I actually got hired by Reckon to be a platform artist. If they had a new line of products coming out, I would have access to that line. They would send it to me. They would send all their like talking points and things they really wanted to stress. And then I would go to hair shows and different professional only stores or cosmetology schools. And I would demonstrate techniques using just that product line. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. So then when you opened your salon in Des Moines, was that the beginning of tutus and tennis shoes or did that have a different name? Was that kind of the beginning of it? That was the beginning of tutus and tennis shoes. Absolutely. So I, (laughs) I started with the name actually, and I just would play with the idea. I mean, I was almost like obsessed with this idea. So before I could even figure out how I was going to do the actual salon aspect. I hadn't figured out if I was going to rent a booth or actually get a full on space. I was playing around with the name tutus and tennis shoes and the branding and building that idea up. And then eventually I rented a booth in a salon and I figured out my clients needed something different. We were not a good fit for a full on salon. And so I started looking for my own space just for us. Okay. I love the name tutus and tennis shoes. I think it's so cute because not only is it like super catchy, it's fun to say, but also it's like a perfect description of what you do. Like you nailed it. That name is money. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) I love it. It is so cute. So I have a bunch of questions that are kind of specific to me and how I can properly care for Ari's hair. And Mm -hmm. so I know that's like kind of selfish and hopefully it's helpful to the listeners on the podcast because I know there are a lot of like foster adoptive moms that are kind of in my shoes too. Yeah. So I I hope I'm not being too selfish by just like specifically asking the questions I want to know, but that's what I plan on doing. (laughs) You know, what's funny, Alex, is a lot of parents ask the same questions. So I'm sure the ones that you ask will actually give comfort to to another parent who's listening, realizing they're not the only ones who wondered that. I sure hope so. I really do. Um, Okay, before the hair questions, I mean, this is kind of a hair question, but it's something that I've been wondering for a really long time. And you've just been like so sweet and so helpful. So I'm deciding to ask this to you. And I'm, I want to be as PC and respectful as I possibly can. And this question is probably so stupid. I'm definitely fearing judgment, but I'm just gonna throw it out there and ask. Um, let's say I am taking Ari in somewhere and I'm wanting to describe her hair, you know, wanting to describe her. Mm-hmm. Is it most respectful to refer to her as a black child or an African-American child, or does it even matter? So I I actually see this conversation a lot in a lot of the forums. Um, Okay. And I think the answer will vary. For me, black is appropriate and it's not offensive. And black is appropriate because it encompasses the full diaspora of African descendants, because if you are of color, I mean, we can be really technical and say that all people are from Africa because, you know, the oldest person, whatever was found in Africa, all that good stuff. But if you are of color, your lineage leads back to Africa. So whether you're in the Caribbean or you're, I don't know, you're in Australia, more than likely your lineage, if you go all the way back, is African. So Black encompasses all that and kind of links us all together versus dividing us up by African-American, Afro-Latina, Afro Caribbean, however, you know, you want to say it. Um, however, I will say that I guess a term African American is a little bit more accepted because it's like on all the forms. Okay. But you know, you know, that's not quite true either because a lot of the forms say black also. Yeah. So I think sometimes with white families or white people in general, they they feel like black maybe have a negative connotation. And in my opinion, it doesn't. 
Yeah. I mean, that's kind of my struggle is I don't know what's correct. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's kind of embarrassing to ask. But really, I I mean, I'm just trying to be respectful. I'm trying to get out as much helpful information as possible. And I'm just trying to figure out the best way to do it. So that's as deep as it's going to go. I really appreciate your like honest and really, really helpful answer. But let's talk about hair. Okay. Let's go. Okay. All right. Cool. So I have heard so much about hair types and curl pattern. And I see these things like 4A, 4B. What does that mean? Yeah. So it's a fairly new way to classify or to describe mostly black hair. If you look at one of those charts, it does go all the way to straight. But most people who are using that chart is they're describing black hair. So like a 3B would kind of be a loose curl, kind of wavy. A 4C would be the tightest curl. Now, when I'm teaching, I do think it's important to kind of have that in the back of your mind, but I don't think it's the beginning and the end all because one, everybody's head has multiple curl patterns in their head. Two, especially with a baby and like a child and you have a baby, an infant, their curl pattern will change. So while you're studying right now and you're like, oh, she definitely has 3A, she has a loose curl, I'm going to get everything for 3A, I'm all about 3A, and then in six months, her hair has changed more to like a 4A or a 4B, now you feel stuck. Okay, that makes sense. And I did notice when she was first born, her hair was very fine and it was straight. And now it's much more curly. Mm -hmm. So is it typical for as a child gets older for their hair to become more curly or does it just it could go either way? It could get more straight, too. So it could actually do either one when they are fresh out of the womb. Their hair has been coated in moisture. You know, it still has. Now my brain, my brain is fried right now. I don't know why. <laughs> but anyway, the baby hair is Lanugo. It's it's not meant to be permanent at all. It's just, and it's just like the hair on their skin. A lot of times baby will come, babies will come out very furry. They have a lot of hair on their face and then that will all shed. It's the same thing on top of their head. So that hair is not meant to stay. It's not permanent. And then the actual curl pattern is defined by the shape of the follicle. So the hole in their scalp, the little bitty tiny hole, the pore basically that the hair strand is growing out of determines the curl pattern of the hair. And that will mature as they mature. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Another phrase that I see quite often and I don't really understand is natural hair. What does natural hair mean? So natural hair is another one of those things that if you're in a natural hair group, Uh, especially within black women, they'll kind of debate it. But natural hair, you're supposed to be talking about just the hair that grows out of your scalp as it is. So you're not talking about hair that you have applied a relaxer or a texturizer to. Typically, if you're talking about natural hair care, you're not including the extensions. You could be talking about hair that the color has been changed, but you're definitely not talking about hair that the texture or the curl pattern has been changed. Okay. Okay. This is giving me so much context to the things that I'm reading. (laughs) This is like, I I don't know if you understand how helpful this is right now. My mind is being blown. Oh, yay. Well, I'm glad to Um, hear that. (laughs) It really is. Okay. So this is another one. And I know opinions probably vary and it probably depends on several factors, but how often do I need to be washing this baby's hair? Okay. So as an infant, she's not doing anything, right? Um, and especially, well, no. she's, you said she's eight months? Yes. Okay. So she may be trying to rub a little milk or food in her hair. You want to rinse that out. <laughs> <laughs> if it's happening daily, yes. then of course you want to rinse it out daily. But you don't necessarily need to be applying a bunch of shampoos or any kind of like detergents. And honestly, I learned the hard way with my son that starting with even the baby shampoos too early kind of dries out their hair and their scalp. So what I tend to tell parents to do is to avoid a bunch of soaps and things on their hair and even their skin, other than their little butts and privates and stuff, so that their skin can build up its own natural barrier. So their skin is trying to balance its own sweat and oil to be able to act as a protective barrier on their skin. If we're constantly washing it away with detergents and soaps and shampoos, it never builds a balance. 
So if we give it time to build a balance and just kind of rinse away the debris and gently moisturize them with something like jojoba oil, something really light, then the skin can find a healthy place for itself. And then by time they're really getting into stuff by like 18 months or whatever, if you start using soaps, you can see what their skin reacts to and what it doesn't. Okay. So if I'm washing her hair like once a week, once every two weeks, is that appropriate? Yeah, it's pretty much appropriate. Um, And again, with her age, I would push it to like every two weeks because she's not super sweaty. She hopefully isn't getting like poop in her hair. She's not able to put, (laughs) you know, dirt in her hair yet. Most she's doing is getting a little bit of food. And a lot of times the food they're eating actually has some conditioning, you know, properties. Oh my goodness. (laughs) So that is so funny. (laughs) If you can rinse it out clean with just water and push her shampoos out to about every two weeks, in my opinion, that's a good routine. If for some reason you feel like somehow she's getting a little bit dirtier or you need to get more out, then yeah, push it to about one week. You shouldn't need to use a shampoo more often than that. And when you're choosing shampoos, go with a very natural line. I don't even recommend Johnson & Johnson because, yes, they say it's tear-free and all that, but it's pretty chemical heavy. And a lot of the reasons that it can be tear-free, in quotations, is because there are chemicals that help reduce your irritation to the other chemicals. So if you go with a more natural line, it won't necessarily be tear-free, but at least it will be less irritating to the skin. Does that make sense? Okay. So you will. Yeah, it does. If you go with a different line of soap, say you had been using Johnson and Johnson and, you know, every once in a while she got a little bubble in her eye and she didn't react at all. And then you switch to a natural one. I cannot guarantee that she won't react because it won't have those chemicals to get rid of that irritation in her eye. Okay. So a two part question then, do you have recommendations on shampoos and conditioners to be using in the bath now that she's so young? And then the second part of that question is, will that change as she gets to be like a toddler or an older child? Um, so let's see particular brands. That's a good one. I haven't thought about baby brands in a long time. Well, do they need to be different than they would be if she were an older child? Well, around school age or so, yeah, you might want to switch up to maybe more kid-oriented shampoo. And mainly because as she gets closer to school age, she's actually getting crap in her hair. She's sweating. You know, yep. she's... I mean, toddlers... And early elementary school kids, I mean, even my 12 year old, they think their head is a dust mop. They roll around. They (laughs) literally rub it on anything. They put covers over their head because they're superheroes one minute. You know, you might even find a bug up there. You never know. So (laughs) um, as they get older and into more things, yeah, you want to use a more effective shampoo. You definitely are going to use a more effective conditioner. So you're probably going to switch to a thicker conditioner as she gets a little older. But when she's an infant, not so much. Like I enjoy Castile soap and you can like even Dr. Bronner's with all the words on his bottles. um, (laughs) You can dilute it pretty (laughs) heavily and just use that on her skin and hair. Just kind of keep it simple. That is a Castile soap. I like Castile soaps in general because they are multi-purpose. Well, and I know too... um... At one point, you had been offering products on your website for sale. And then I know you said that you had some um, like manufacturing difficulties due to COVID. Do you sell shampoos and conditioners? Is it um, like leave-in conditioner? What type of products is it that you've been able to manufacture? So I uh, manufacture a natural baseline. It's vegan friendly. I try to be as eco-friendly as possible also. I do offer a shampoo and conditioner. I would not necessarily say to use it on an infant, but when she got closer to toddler, like 18 months or so, it'd be fine to go from 18 months on up. And and that includes the instant conditioner. So as you learn more about her hair care, and I'm going to finish answering your question, you'll see that there are (laughs) instant conditioners, which is like the one you use pretty much if you shampoo every day, you're putting in a conditioner right after it every day. Those are called instant conditioners. And then there's deep conditioners, which you'll see heavily marketed towards black hair. And so as she gets older, you'll invest in a deep conditioner also. So I offer a shampoo and conditioner, and then I offer a leave-in, a cream, and an oil. And the reason why I chose those five products is because I wanted everybody to have a strong base to go from for healthy hair care. Because a lot of times when I'm teaching, people have a hard time 
figuring out which product is really a cream and which product is really an oil. So I decided that when I started my line, um, and I got a lot of feedback from the parents I was already teaching also, that these were the most important products to put on the market and put them in a package form. So it's pretty much an easy shopping experience. You buy the Magic 3, you have all three of them. They're literally named the LCO. And so you know which order to put them in if you're following that acronym. Okay. So do you use each of these products every day or how often should you be using each of these products? It depends on the hairstyle. So if your child is too young or their hair is too short to really do protective styling, then you're going to end up using the LCO every day. If your child is old enough or has hair that's long enough that you can at least get it into plaits or twists or like some ponies, then you're going to be using all three on hair day, which is a lot of times for families on a Sunday like today. So you would go from shampoo condition to adding the L and the C, styling, and then you'll use the O towards the end. And then on like Wednesday, if your hair day is on Sunday, on like Wednesday, you refresh the L and the O to add moisture and to seal in the moisture. Oh my, okay, cool. That makes sense. I have tons of questions on protective hairstyles as well, but I still have some questions about the bath. So I want to do that first. Otherwise my brain will not stay on track. (laughs) I completely understand. (laughs) So another thing I had read, and I don't know if this is true or not, but it is that I should only be combing her hair and detangling when she's in the bath with wet hair and with conditioner on her hair. Is that accurate? So yes. And yes, basically hair is a fiber and hair is more resilient and has more bounce back when it is wet. And it's also more slick. So it has more slip. If you read the side of some of your products that you're using now, especially like what's that kinky curly, not today. Um, I think it talks about slip and what it's saying is there's an ingredient in there that reduces the amount of friction between the individual hair strands. Well, you can reduce friction between the individual hair strands by just getting the hair wet. Then if you want to apply a conditioner, that adds even more slip. She's young. Her hair probably is still fine and has very low porosity, which means it's a lot shinier. The cuticles are laying really close to each other. They won't catch each other like Velcro. As she gets older, if her hair begins to have a tighter curl pattern, her cuticles will stand out from the strand a little bit more because they're standing out to allow that flex in the curl. Um, And then they'll catch each other. So you want to add slip to reduce that friction so you can glide a comb through or so you can pull the knots apart with your fingers. Okay. See, and now I'm thinking back to all those like shampoo and conditioner commercials that I've seen on TV where they do like a microscopic view of a piece of hair and then you can see yes. all the cuticles and I'm feeling like that is so helpful now it's it's all coming together <laughs> yes so do you have a recommendation for a detangling comb so I sell one I call it the what do I call it oh geez <laughs> I call it the crown care detangling comb. I'm pretty sure that's what I call it. But either way, to start off with a detangling comb, you want to start off with a wider tooth comb or like a wet brush. And I say wet brush in particular, not the off brands, because a lot of times the little nodules on the tips of the brushes, if it's a cheaper lower end brush, those won't be sealed to the bristle and they'll catch and rip out hair. So I really like Mm -hmm. the brushes and the combs that have more space and or the the bristles or teeth are able to flex. And so they're not ripping the hair out. So like my brush, the um, bristles are able to flex. The whole back of the brush opens up like it flexes right to left. And then when you get ready to style, so this is a part that I notice a lot of white parents who've adopted black kids miss. When you get ready to style, you have to detangle completely. So you can't just go okay. from that wide tooth comb detangle or that finger detangle and then try to throw a braid in because there's like a bunch of knots and curls that have not been um, taken care of. And when you put that braid in, that's when you get that messy looking twister braid. And you're like, why is it still frizzy? Or why does her hair look mad? Because it is. You got to fully detangle oh, okay. with a smaller comb. So you're going to start off with your wider one or like your wet brush or something like that. And then when you get ready to style, say putting in a braid, you go in with a finer rat tail. I usually use a rat tail comb. 
Okay. Okay. See, we were using just the little comb that came home from the hospital uh-huh. with her. And it has very, like the, what are they called? The bristles? The bristles are very close uh-huh. together. And it's gotten more and more difficult to detangle. And then, of course, my son lost the little <laughs> comb. So I've been using a wide tooth pick comb uh-huh. instead. And it sounds like my best bet is to do one after the other. Do the pick comb first and then the smaller bristle So I guess comb. I should be asking you, how long is Ari's hair? Well, okay, so that's the other crazy thing. I would say if it's, like, pulled out and uncoiled, it's probably six or seven inches okay. long. So, I, I mean, I guess I don't know if that's considered long or short or if her hair grows quickly or not. But, yeah, I would say, like, six or seven inches long. And it, I feel like it's growing very quickly. Every time I bathe her and detangle her hair, I feel like it's just grown so oh, much. It probably is. She's a little baby. So, yeah, the hair grows a lot faster for infant. most infants. The hair grows a lot faster than, say, uh, like, a, I'm 30, Um, So like, you know, the hair has different growth speeds. And so for her, hers may be growing fairly fast, especially if she's getting a nice balanced diet. That's another thing parents will want to know about how they can make their child's hair grow. And honestly, hair grows about half an inch per month, but it varies because of diet and age and like lifestyle. So for her, because she's an infant and she's getting a healthy diet, hers is probably flourishing. It's just doing the most right now. And that's awesome. But at six to seven inches, you should, and I'm looking at one of your pictures on Instagram. I think it's from April 12th. It's, yeah. So that was several months ago. So it's grown quite a bit since okay. then. Even. So on that picture, her hair looks pretty fine and it might be hard to like get a braid or something in it. But if it has grown and it's gotten curlier and it really is six to seven inches, you can start looking at um, using a wide tooth comb, like you said, like that pick that you have, and maybe follow through with the, mm-hmm. the hospital comb. I'm wondering if it's one of those little short black barber combs. Is that what you have? No, it's like cream colored and it does have like a little handle on it. But I would say the bristles are about the same um, closeness together as one of those like little black barber combs. Okay, that one might actually be almost too fine. Okay. I use, let's see if I can find a quick place to pull it up. I use a Cricut rat tail comb and I'm going to try to pull it up to see if it actually tells me the measurements in between the teeth because they have one that's super, super fine. And that's really hard to comb through textured or curly hair with. And then they have one that's a little bit more spaced out. So I pulled it up and it says the Cricut Silk Comb Pro 55 Wide Tooth Rat Tail Comb. That name is a little misleading because I just told you to use like a wide tooth comb and I'm thinking of more of like a quarter of an inch gap. That way it will, you know, guide through her hair. But this one is not nearly that big. Like it's probably like a 16th of an inch and I'm not great at math. So Okay. I hope nobody measures that. That's okay. I mean, I... No, I feel like I'm like I'm picturing the combs you're talking about. And I feel like the first one, like the wide tooth, I would consider like a traditional pit comb or even wider Mm -hmm. than that. Does that sound right? Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so my next question then, I guess. So I've washed, I've conditioned, I've detangled. What do I do right after the bath? So right after the bath, normally... Well, I shouldn't say normally. So for her age right now, you are going to apply, mm, she's eight months. I would say apply a little leave-in and maybe a a light oil like jojoba oil. Okay, okay. See, I have not seen jojoba oil at the store. I haven't specifically Mm -hmm. looked for it. But, I mean, can I get it? at like the grocery store or Target or Walmart? I mean, is it easy to Yeah, come so in Target, it should be almost in the area where you're buying your more organic soaps and skincare. It comes in a little pump bottle. It's like a little brown glass bottle with a little pump on it, like for a serum. It's okay. a little bit more expensive, but the reason why I suggest jojoba oil, especially for infants, is it's the oil that mimics the body's natural sebum the most. So it usually has the least amount of allergic reactions or any kind of like adverse reactions. Okay. So as soon as your products are back available on your website, I'm definitely going that okay. route. Okay. I appreciate but it. <laughs> 
in the meantime, um, well, because you're like, it, it sounds like you have a system that's very easy to follow. And I'm so on board for that. <laughs> But in the meantime, so let's say I'm washing our hair every week and a half or two mm -hmm. weeks. Now, how often in between should I do jojoba oil or should I like do another leave-in conditioner? What do I do in between the yeah. baths? Yeah, so her hair is mostly free. Like you're not putting it in any braids or anything right now. So you're going to need to Correct. apply a little leave-in and a little oil daily. Okay, every, every single, single day. day. Got it. Um, and especially pay attention to the back of her head. Cause she's going to rub it on the high chair, the car seat, anything that she's sitting on. And yes. A lot of times you'll notice balding around those areas. It's completely normal, but the more you keep it moisturized, yes. the less she'll be able to rub it out to a certain extent. When the hair is moisturized, it has a little bit more slip. Like I said, it has more elasticity, so it doesn't cause as much damage. Not to say that you avoid the baldness altogether, but you may be able to salvage some of it. Okay. Yeah, she definitely has um, like a lot of bald spots in the back of her head. And we have been trying to keep that area very well moisturized. Mm -hmm. And then I know we'll get like stains on her crib sheets and on her high chair and in her car mm -hmm. seat. Is there any way to get that stuff out? Am I am I asking the wrong person? I don't no, know. No, not necessarily asking the wrong person. Um, So yeah, because it's a lot of oil based products typically for our hair. Um, so one way to yes. break it down is to use a little bit of Dawn dish detergent. So for oh, okay. for instance, I just keep a bottle of Dawn in my laundry area. I use it on the neck of certain shirts where I see I might have gotten too much. And I use shea butter on my skin anyway. And so if I have gotten too much shea butter on my skin and it rubs off on a shirt, well, then I'll treat that shirt or whatever with Dawn dish detergent right there at the washing machine before I throw it in the wash. So that's one way to get the stuff out. You might be applying a little too much. And, I, and I'm and i kind of almost scared to say that because typically it's the opposite. Like usually with white <laughs> yeah. parents, um, I'm teaching them to apply more, apply more, apply more. Because with straight hair, you're not used to applying a bunch of products. So. Right. Okay. That makes sense. And it helps the suggestion of the dawn as well, because I like I probably wouldn't have thought of that. And I feel like I've been like washing her crib sheets or I'll wash the um, fabric on her car seat. And I just do it with like regular uh, laundry mm -hmm. soap and it doesn't come up. So I'm trying the dawn. I'll try okay. that next. I know we talked about this a little bit earlier, but let's get into like the hairstyles. What's a protective hairstyle? What does that so mean? So a protective hairstyle is literally a style that goes in that is meant to stay anywhere between a couple of days to a couple of weeks to a couple of months. And in that amount of time, it's protecting the hair from frequent manipulation, from breakage, and from loss of moisture. The most protective styles have the ends tucked in or in some kind of casing. Um, with little girls, a lot of times that's beads. Yes. With adult women, black women, a lot of times that looks like the ends are in buns or they're covered in extensions somehow. Okay. Okay. So at what age should she be before I start thinking about doing that? Or d does her hair just need to be a certain so, length and the age doesn't yeah, matter? Yeah, it's more of a length than an age. And actually right now, you should be practicing hair time with her. So she is used to to sitting and allowing someone to touch her hair and manipulate her hair a little bit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so that way you don't have <laughs> such a defiant toddler on your hands when her hair is truly <laughs> long enough and needs to be in some style. The other thing, again, like I was saying, toddlers and kids are human dust mop. So if she has already oh, yeah. gotten used to sitting and started building up some patience and building up tolerance of somebody touching her hair, combing through her hair, by the time she's 18 months to two and you need to put braids in because she's rubbing her head on everything and you don't want to come comb it out every 30 minutes, you don't have a little person fighting with you as much. Oh, I love that. That is great yeah. advice. Okay, so you're thinking about 18 months or two, maybe the age where you start doing the protective hairstyles. At that age, how long is their hair? Like an inch is... I don't know if this is a good question or if you would know this, but how long would their hair be at so that So that point? varies a lot. Um, I have friends who have children that, you know, were two and they barely had any hair. What they rubbed out as an infant hadn't grown back yet. 
And then I have other friends by two, their hair was past their shoulders. So that really varies. And as long as you have started the healthy routine and she's getting a healthy diet, what her hair does at that age is completely normal for her. So okay. if her hair is that long enough sense. to put in little ponytails, then you want to start that. So you'll see a lot of babies with little puffs. They don't need to be super tight because then you'll pull her hair out of her scalp and they don't need to be necessarily perfect. So they're going to frizz up some, her curls are going to come out a little, but you start building the routine of doing little puffs and having a little bit of tension. Then by the time she gets old enough or her hair is long enough, when you put a braid in it, it won't feel as abnormal to her. If you're doing a regular, what's called a box braid or a plait, she shouldn't feel a lot of tension anyway. But sometimes children who have never really had their hair done until they're two or three, they pick at it because it's something new. Okay. So her hair is definitely long enough for little ponytails or little puffs. Should I be doing that right now? Should I be doing it every day? Yeah, you do want to start putting in puffs. And when you put them in, typically you're going to use very small rubber bands. Don't try to pull those out. Just snip them out with like a nail clipper or a seam ripper. And that way they won't break her hair. So, oh my goodness, this is so helpful. <laughs> you do want to start playing with styles um, every day or every couple of days to get her, like again, building that routine and getting her used to it. Also, when you put her hair in styles, puffs are not as protective, clearly, but you'll notice that where you gathered the hair together to put the rubber band on it, the moisture from the product will have stayed. And over time, you're trying to have more of that. So if you can get a little braid in it, guess what? That braid is going to hold on to more moisture than that puff did. It's just building on top of each oh, other, okay. building your skills and building your techniques on top of each other for more benefits. So I'm a little intimidated, especially by the more complicated hairstyles. Is it something that parents typically learn to do or do they usually take their kids to somebody who's more experienced? So it's a mixture of both. And I'm a hairstylist and I love when y'all come to me because that makes money. But <laughs> yes. if you don't learn it at home, you can't teach it to her. And then she won't know how to do it herself when she gets to be a teenager, an adult, or even when she has kids. And I've heard a lot of um, yes. adoptees who are now adults say that they wish their parents had invested more time and effort into learning more about their skin and hair care. And I can only imagine, like I'm a woman, I'm a single mom, there are some things about being a man that I'm not going to be able to show my son. And that hurts my feelings sometimes. So I can only imagine as a mom, looking at your child coming into their own as a preteen and teenager and not still not knowing anything about their hair and skin and not being able to give that to them. And then them growing up, being an adult and not being able to give it to their own child. I love that. I absolutely love it because this whole time I'm thinking, okay, how do I do what's right for her and learn all of this stuff and do what I'm supposed to be doing at the right time and buy all the right products. And I'm like so consumed with how I can do this the right way. And I didn't even think far enough in the future to, well, how is she going to learn how to do this when she gets older? So that is, it's, that's such good advice. And I love that you yes, said that. That's why it's kind of a combination, you know? You can study online all day. And I mean, this is going to sound like a cheap plug, but unless you're taking a class similar to mine where it breaks down the science and it takes you step by step, it gets overwhelming and it's hard to put all the pieces together unless you're going into a salon. And even sometimes going into a salon, you're still kind of left in a void. There's still different pieces. There's terminologies. There's culture differences that just won't make sense. And sometimes you won't even know what to ask um, and when to ask. So that's why it's very much so a combination. You're going to learn how to keep her hair healthy and do a lot of the basic stuff at home and maybe even build into some of the more intricate braiding styles or you know whatever feels comfortable for you. But it's still important that she goes into a salon and has access to the Black community because at the end of the day, she's going to always be Black. And so there's going to be conversations yep. that she picks up on. There's going to be little techniques that she may see in passing. There's going to be self-affirming things that happen in the salon that you'll never be able to duplicate at home because there's nobody else black in the household. Even if you got another black child, you know, there's no aunties and cousins and sisters and people to kind of lead the way for her in that, in that aspect. Yep. 
Yep, absolutely. And I'm glad you brought up your classes because I definitely wanted to talk about that. How many classes do you offer? So right now I offer one. I'm really, really putting a lot of time and attention into this one um, because I want to make sure that it is meeting everybody's needs. And so this one class literally walks you through the very basics of science. Um, Like I was talking about the cuticle. It talks about the molecules. It talks about how the protein is built up. It talks about product usage, what products and like the ingredients, not just brands. Um, Even though I have my own line, I like to teach in a way that you can take the information and literally go from any child's head and to any product. Because you may be on vacation and left tutus and tennis shoes lying at home, but you walk into Target, I want you to be able to feel empowered to buy what you need. And like you're a foster parent, Ari's there with you now, but what if you bring in two more children and their hair texture is different? I want you from this one class to feel confident and empowered to be able to take care of all three. You know what I mean? Yes, yes. And I 100% plan on registering for the class and taking the class. I didn't want to do it before I talked to you because I wanted to come at it from the perspective of somebody who has no experience like Mm -hmm. I do right now. But yeah, I'm really excited to take it. How long is the class? How does it work? It's online, Yeah, so it's online. It's on demand. You can start it whenever you want to. You can log in and watch the demonstrations and the videos whenever you want to. Um, Once you have enrolled, you have 365 days under that, you know, to finish the class. Um, You also, at the end of the class, you'll get a 101 video chat with me. It's a a part of the price. And then you also get three months in the support group um, right after the class. So once you finish, you get to the end, there's a survey. It includes the link. You click the link and now you're part of the support group. Because what I realized um, with anything that you're trying to learn, especially something like a life skill, you have got to practice it. And it's not fun to get a lesson and then just get dropped off into the abyss and, you know, you not have further support or cheering or even direction. And like, um, so people will post, you know, a picture and be like, this is my first time trying cornrows. I think it looks okay, but something's not right. And I can usually pinpoint and be like, okay, so your hand placement was X, Y, Z. This is what you need to do. And then the next picture, you can see an improvement. So although it's online and a lot of people are like, well, it's online. Like, am I really going to learn how? Yes, you really are going to learn how because I set it up so I take you from beginning to end and then give you support to make sure that you get your money's worth. And this is something that you can go through. I mean, it's 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 you literally take it through your lifetime and your child's lifetime, you know? Yes, I am committing to taking this class. And also in one of the next episodes of the podcast, when I'm finished taking the class, I'm going to report back and I'm going to tell you how well I did. I mean, I'm just going to start off by saying I'm not very coordinated, (laughs) but I want to learn. I'm committed to doing it. So I will report back how I am ready to hear your feedback. Like I am game for you. Because I want to, you know, I was saying on one of my lives on Instagram, I really wanted to document a family that goes from knowing very little to finishing the class. And let's see what they, let's see what their skills are like in a year. So I'm game. I want to hear all the feedback. All right. (laughs) I will do it. I will be your guinea pig. (laughs) We're starting from scratch. And I've learned so much already just in the like 45 minutes that we've been talking. And I am committed to learning as much as I possibly can. So I'm on board. Let's do this. (laughs) I'm excited. You know what? I think I also I have to go in and put in a um, coupon code, but I want to offer your listeners a discount. And so they can take the class with you. I think it'll be kind of cool to see your progress and see like how you start, um, especially with the eight month old and see theirs right, you know, right beside you. Oh, heck yes. Yes. Thank you for that. That is so nice. Yeah. If you're able to set up a discount code, we would absolutely love it. We would use it. Um, Let us know what it is whenever you get it. I will set that up today. Cool. Thank you. But you're not off the hook because I still have more questions for you. (laughs) Okay, cool. So we were talking about protective hairstyles. How long do they last? So that's a good question. Protective hairstyles can last from a couple of days. So your ponytails, Um, especially on your younger girls, you will get at max about a week from them. And the reason is there are bigger sections and the kids are much more rough on their head. But your cornrow styles, because they're smaller sections and more detailed, they will last um, up to a month. 
I like the yeah. sound of that. <laughs> and then your styles, for instance, I'm wearing box braids with extensions. They should have lasted up to three months, but I am very rough on my hair. I am a hypocrite and don't tie it up every night. And I go swimming and jump in lakes and all kind of stuff. So at a month, I'm literally taking them down. So that's that kind of actually gives you a good idea of what to expect. It not only goes from the age range, but also the lifestyle plays a part into how long your hairstyles, you can expect your hairstyles to last. Okay, so tell me a little bit about that, the lifestyle while you have a protective hairstyle in as far as like washing your hair. And you also talked about if you're swimming or jumping in a lake, how does that work? I mean, you can do all of those things. How do you do it differently? Right. So when you have a little one with ponytails, expect like say you're going to the beach. So let's fast forward with Ari. She is two and a half her hair is maybe to past her ears. You've gotten some ponytails in. You're going to the beach. You're probably going to end up having to take that hairstyle down to get all the sand out that day. But if you're, oh, <laughs> if, <laughs> okay. if you're going to the beach, say four days in a row, to be real honest with you, I would wait to the end of the four days. Like I would try to get as much out daily as I can. But then at the end of four days, now I'm taking it out and we're doing the whole like lay back in the bathtub, let the sand sink to the bottom of the bathtub type thing to get it all out. So again, there's not like a hard steadfast rule for everything, but I try to cover some of the stuff like let's say swimming in most bodies of water. If you know you're going swimming, I would do something like you soak the hair in clean tap water. So before you get in the pool, the ocean, whatever, stop at those little showers, soak the hair down in water. If you have time or you have it with you, go ahead and even coat the hair in an oil. Like I usually use like a castor oil because it's really thick and then go swimming. The reason being is hair again is a fiber. If you've already saturated in clean water, it can't soak up the chlorine water or the ocean water or these other types of water that will cause some damage and dryness to the hair. Now you come out of swimming. If you're not going swimming anymore that week or whatever, now is shampoo day. If you are going swimming again the next day, then you're going to rinse, 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 rinse as much as possible out. And then you're going to L and O while it's still in the style. Got yeah. it. Okay. Okay. This is so helpful. So then at bedtime, should I be putting her hair in a bonnet or when do I do that? Um, Absolutely. So right now she's still really young. It's just going to build routine, but it's not going to stay on. So at eight months, I kind of, kind of wouldn't worry about it till about like 14 months where she has a little bit more memory. Okay. So you're putting a, a bonnet on and try to get one that fits. Like, I like slap caps. Those are... What did you call it? They're called slap caps. They're satin lined caps. And I'm looking up... Like slap? Like like I yes. slap someone? Slap yes. cat? <laughs> okay, okay. I'm looking this up <laughs> as we're talking. So the original brand of slap caps was by Grace. And I don't know how to pronounce her last name, but it's E-L-E-Y-A-E. The reason okay. I like those caps is because it's not a like a hard elastic. And what happens with children is you send them to bed with their bonnet or whatever head covering placed perfectly. And they roll around like they're having a war in their sleep. And then the elastic mm -hmm. is rubbing on their hairline. And eventually it rubs it out. Okay. The slap caps yep. don't have that elastic right there. The whole cap on the outside is knit. And then the inside is satin and it fits kind of snug. So it stays on. So I think they have an infant sized one. Yeah. I'm looking at the adult one right now on Amazon. It looks like you can get two of them for oh, 20 Oh, she has bucks, a sale right and now. There's awesome. all different. I don't, well, maybe I'm hoping I'm telling you the right thing. It says slap cap. I don't know. I might not be looking at the right brand, but I'm thinking you could probably get these on Amazon or maybe just from her yeah, website. Yeah, so I'm on her website right now, and she does have a buy one, get one sale going on. But I'm looking to see what sizes she has now. Okay. But, okay, so there's multiple ways to cover the head. This is just one. And for your younger ones, again, it's not, you're not looking for perfection. You're looking to build routine. If she has ponytails or puffs, and usually the puffs you're going to take down at night, that's kind of a 50-50. Some parents take them down. Some parents leave them in. If you start to see breakage, you absolutely need to take them down at night. 
If you don't see any breakage, you can kind of leave them in for a couple of days. It's fine. Um, ponytails, as she's getting older, they typically stay in all week. And you will use either like a cap like this, like I'm describing, or you will use a scarf. The scarf is awesome because once you tie it on, it gives you a really snug fit that doesn't allow for a lot of frizz. So for like cornrow styles, things that are more sleek and close to the scalp, you want a scarf more than you want a bonnet. That bonnet is going to move around. It's going to allow the braids to get frizzy. Okay, so this might be a really dumb question, but... Should her hair be in a protective hairstyle? Like, let's say she's two right now, every mm-hmm. single day. Yep. And it, and you know what? Okay. The the great part about it is it saves your life because at two she's busy, and so if her hair is free or is in puffs, she's constantly tangling it up. So then you have to sit there and detangle it every day, or maybe even more than once a day. So if you Oh, no. (laughs) So that's a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And then you're, you know, debating with the toddler. That's not always fun. They're probably whining at you or telling you they want snacks or whatever craziness they have come up with because they're a toddler. (laughs) So you save yourself some of that by putting it in at least ponytails and braiding or twisting those ends down. Throw some beads or a barrette on there and leave her be for the week. Okay. Yes. That I love the idea of making my life easier, (laughs) too. So you're speaking my language. (laughs) So I know, so this is when we're going to talk a little bit about culture difference. I know a lot of adoptive parents, ooh and ah, over the Instagram profiles of Black kids and this, this, and that, even the ones who finally get out their comfort zone and are looking at Black families and Black kids. And they're like, oh, but I see such and such hair is free all the time. Not necessarily all the time. That could be for those pictures. Because typically, if you are in a diverse community and you're able to see Black families on a day-to-day basis, more than likely their little kid's hair is in protective styles. They're in ponytails or they're in cornrows because nobody has time to sit there and fight with the kid all day, every day about hair. Got it. Yeah, okay. So my goal is protective hairstyle all the time. That's just how it needs to be. I mean, it's a win-win for you as far as time and maintenance, but it also allows her hair to be, again, protected maintain moisture and retain length. Your goal is retaining length. Her hair is going to grow as long as she's healthy, eating well, you know, not super stressed out. All those internal things are all taken care of. Hair is going to grow about a half an inch per month. So your job on the outside of the body is retaining length. And one of the main ways to retain length is protective styling. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. I have one more hair question for you. Okay. So this is probably so dumb, but Her little baby hairs that grow up on Uh her forehead, they are so stinking cute, but I see pictures of people who will like comb them down and put product in them and style those little baby hairs. I'm so clueless when it comes to this. What do I need to know? (laughs) You need to know, don't worry about those yet. Um, Again, they do it, you know, that saying they do it for the gram. When they're that young, um, (laughs) you can take water. And brush them down and snap a quick picture if you just want to see it. But to think that it's going to stay like that, even with the heaviest gel, it's not going to stay all day. And it's not even worth the trouble or the possible damage to her hair to try to get it to stay all day. Once she gets older, when you get ready for picture day, you do want to go ahead and pay attention to her edges, apply some product, get them nice and smooth or whatever. You don't necessarily have to do all the cute little waves and sea designs if you can by all means do but if you can't it's not a huge deal but again it's only going to last for a couple of hours at best up until late (laughs) middle school high school when she starts to care okay yep and she's gonna stop rolling around on the ground and playing with them with her hands and messing (laughs) with them exactly All right. That makes sense. I feel like I learned more than if I read the internet for two weeks straight. (laughs) This was so helpful. Let me ask you this. Did I miss anything? Did I forget anything? Um, No, you asked a lot of, and you kept saying, like, I feel like these might be dumb questions, but they're not. I get a lot of these questions on a regular basis. So let's talk about a little bit of the culture difference because I I figured out this is why my business was needed. When a white family walks a black child into a black salon, a lot of times the white family feels very insecure and nervous and wonders what everybody is thinking. And that will 
sometimes keep you from asking the questions that you need to ask, right? You shut yeah. down kind of. On the stylist side, it's so a part of our culture that we don't, even I, like I have close white friends who have adopted black children and they have to remind me or say to me, Kanisha, I don't know what that means. Or Kanisha, where, where does this come from? Kanisha, why do black women do this, this and that? Because we grow up and it's our norm. We don't remember or don't even think about teaching you so that your child has access to that information. That makes sense. Okay. So we basically, we shouldn't feel super embarrassed when we have a question that we feel is dumb. Um, No, you shouldn't. Because at the end of the day, it's for your child. I'm not going to say every salon experience is going to be perfect because I've heard some, you know, some terrible stories. I'm not going to say every barber trip is going to be perfect. But in general, let's go eight times out of 10, a black stylist is already trained in multiple hair textures. And, and a lot of times in our society, because again, you can't completely separate hair from some of our societal issues. So a lot of times black people are already groomed to be more accepting of white people. Does that make sense? So a lot of times the insecurities that you're coming into the salon with will not actually ever be a problem because we see you with your child and we see you trying. That's really good to know because, I mean, there's so many ways to do things wrong, Mm -hmm. I feel like. And at the end of the day, like, I just want to do what's best for her. And if that means I'm reaching out for information and collecting resources and learning everything I possibly can until the day I die. That's what I'm going to do. That's an awesome attitude. That's an, you know, that's an awesome attitude. And I really wish more adoptive parents took on that attitude because there, again, I can't promise that every interaction is going to be perfect. I can't promise that every black woman that you see in Walmart or Target is going to be ready to help you or not say something rude. But what I can say is take it with a grain of salt You might have to grow a little bit thicker skin because at the end of the day, you need to or your child will appreciate you doing that for them. Even if they don't recognize it until they're, you know, off in college, it it takes that to, to really get them to a place where they can be confident and comfortable and empowered in their own skin and hair in our society. Yeah. Well, and on the other side of things, too, I mean, I can't guarantee that every white parent that's raising black children will care as much as I'm trying to, to preserve their culture and properly care for their hair and do all the things that are involved to, to keep her yeah. connected. So, I mean, everybody is different. Everybody has a different perspective, but at the end of the day, it's important to talk about, it's important to maintain communication. And I'm like, so beyond thankful for you that you helped me do Yay. that today. Well, no problem, dear. I'm really excited about this. I can't wait to um, hear your feedback, especially after you start taking the class. I am on. I'm ready to go. So if my listeners want to contact you after the podcast, if they have stupid (laughs) questions, um, how can they find you and how can they sign up for your courses? So the best way is to go to the website, which is tutustennisshoes.com. And there is a tab at the top that says education. You can go down to beauty and science. Got it. To learn more about the actual beauty and science class, the whole (laughs) <laughs> my graphics person told me to stop calling it a webinar, but I, it's stuck in my head. So <laughs> to learn more <laughs> about that class, or you can also go to the tab that says education and you can schedule a one-on-one video chat with me. If you don't feel like you want to go through the whole class right away, the one-on-one video chat is great to work out specific issues. Like say you've been trying to do cornrows or you've been trying to do Bantu knots or, you know, you just have something that you really feel like is very, very specific to your family. That's a great way to get a hold of me and we can go through everything in that time. So those are the two best ways. Also on the website, you can shoot me an email or contact us because it's just me. I take a while to get back to everybody's questions, but a lot of times they're kind of the same questions. So if you go ahead to the class, you'll have the (laughs) answers. I almost can promise you that. Got it. I am signing up Okay, well, wait, wait, let me get you the coupon code. For you and your listeners. That's okay. What I can do is I can post it in the description of the podcast. And then also what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a post on my Instagram. My Instagram is at Barely Braided Mm -hmm. Podcast. And I'll put the coupon code there too. So that's where you can find it. That sounds awesome. 
Cool. Before we wrap for the day, I do want to encourage listeners to leave a positive review on the Purple Apple Podcast app because it really is the best way to help promote this podcast and our guests, their businesses, as well as spread the word to foster and adoptive parents looking for helpful resources like this. Also, a big thanks to this week's podcast editor, Ruben Andrews. And of course, the hugest of thanks, Kanisha. I'm so glad you were here today. Thank you. Thank you. No thank problem. you. Perfect. Have a great day. Thank you. you. Okay. Bye.